Tim Sutherland on the excavations at Agincourt. Tim is visiting fellow in Battlefield Archaeology at the University of York and founder of the Conflict Archaeology International Research Network and the Journal of Conflict Archaeology. He has directed a number of highly high profile projects, especially the Towton project, which I believe was the bloodiest battle on the land of the United Kingdom. And he has made many startling discoveries, and he has carried out important work at <coughs> court and other battlefields in the United Kingdom and elsewhere. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'd like to discuss the archaeology uh, that's taken place at Agincourt. Um, for such a famous event, you would think that everybody's had a go at uh, a bit of archaeology over the last several hundred years, but it's been very, very restricted. And so what I want to do is discuss the work of particularly John Woodford <coughs> and my work since uh, uh, 2002. Uh, now, the Battle of Agincourt has indicated a great deal of historical research, as we've just heard from Anne, and Anne covers it incredibly well in the uh, Sources and Interpretations book. And that was in 2002, wasn't it? 2000. 2000. So, yes, the history has been covered extensively, but that's not something you can say about the archaeology. The archaeological potential of the battlefield has attracted far less attention. This can generally be summed up using two periods of investigations. One, the investigations undertaken at excavations in 1818 by uh, John Woodford, John George Woodford. I'll be calling him John George after this first couple of reasons. And the archaeological work undertaken between uh, 2002 and the present by myself and some of my colleagues. Here's one of my uh, colleagues doing a metal detector survey over the battlefield itself. Not the easiest of jobs, um, especially under uh, terrain, over terrain like that. But more about uh, John Woodford first. <coughs> he was born on the 20th of February 1785, the second son of Lieutenant uh, Colonel John Woodford and Lady Susan Gordon. And he had quite a good aristocratic background and therefore his military career, uh, you've got to bear in mind that's what it was all about. He was born with money and uh, uh, titles, etc. He died on the 22nd of March in 1879, aged 94, which was quite, a, quite an age for those days. He, he was allegedly the last English survivor of the Battle of Waterloo, which few people know about. He worked with Wellington at Waterloo as one of his aides. His brother, Alexander George Woodford, was sent by Wellington to hold Humor Farm during the Battle of Waterloo. So even his brother was in, uh, quite uh, important in the scene of Waterloo. Alexander ultimately became Field Marshal, and John George obtained the rank of Major General. So they have a good military career in parallel. John died in. Uh, late 18th century and he's buried at Crossley Church in Keswick and it took me about an hour and a half to find this tombstone in, in the cemetery nobody knew where it was uh, which is surprising because here's his grave and next up one is the grave of the Poland Gloria Robert Southey who we'll be hearing about this afternoon so that's an, as an aside it goes to show that sometimes he can be completely overshadowed by somebody else. And even the people in the churchyard, the church and the church authorities didn't know that Woodford was in their graveyard and they didn't know his importance. So in 1818, uh, John George was appointed to the command of the Army of the Occupation in France until, his final, until its final evacuation in October of that year. He took advantage of his position to obtain leave to make a survey of the field of Battle of and its vicinity and to carry out excavations. During his excavations, he recorded in a notebook the location, the, uh, the area he investigated, and what he discovered. Unfortunately, this notebook is now missing. Much to my frustration, because there's a huge amount of information in there that I cannot gain access to. In fact, very little remained of these notes and artifacts for public scrutiny, 
leaving some to question how much of this information is authentic. And that's what I'm going to be discussing primarily at the, at the moment. So if we look at some of his letters, two of his letters which are available in the Warwick Art Guides, which he wrote to his brother Alexander describing the excavations survived. And here's one of them. In the first letter, dated the 20th of February 1818, Woodford stated that he found artefacts, quote, in the ground where the knights were buried amongst a quantity of bones and the remains of skulls, his spelling of mine, particularly teeth. <coughs> uh, he was writing to his brother every week or two. They were very, very close. There are a lot of letters, but these are the ones, the only two letters relating to his work at Agincourt. He even uh, got his men, his surveyors, to, drew, to draw up a plan of the battlefield. And on that, he included lots of details and interpretations that he found from the locals. So much of what we think we know about the battlefields has been shaped by Woodsford's map. On his map, he noted a small enclosure marked by a cross and noted it as number nine, place of internment of 5,800 French knights. Now that is from a French document, the 5,800 figure number. <laughs> Anne could probably tell me exactly which one it was, but I'll, you'll have to ask her later. Um, and so what he's doing is he's acquiring information from somewhere and then putting this information on his map. Since 1885, this enclosure has contained a cavalry or a cross constructed to commemorate those who died in the battle. And there's a very early photograph of it after the hedges uh, uh, grow up and the trees are starting to sprout. In his letter of the 20th of February, Woodford stated that by the end of the first day, his excavations had already found, quote, two coins of the highest preservation. They are of Charles's reign, very thin and apparently very <coughs> pure gold like a ducat, and he sketched them handily for his brother and our us to see. And there it is. And these coins are quite common. Uh, and as an example, you can see it's an exact parallel of the drawing. So he found a coin and he sketched it. He's very like an archaeologist. He's doing something, excavating, and then he's recording what he's finding. According to Woodsford's biographer, Crossside, <coughs> by the end of the excavations he had allegedly found, quote, several gold cock trams, so the number's already going up. He found four gold rings, which were destroyed by a fire, and that's in the Pantheon in London, a big storehouse uh, of uh, furniture and belongings to the aristocracy, and it was destroyed. The finger rings and other artefacts were noted in a review in the Naval and Military Magazine of Harris Nichols' study of the Battle of Agincourt, published in 1827, as Anna has alluded to. The reviewer wrote that the role of Agincourt revives amongst us all the old enthusiasm which the digging up of the ground itself by Colonel Woodford after our last continental victories, remember this is just after Waterloo, uh, excited in every Englishman's breast. We remember them handling the relics he found, so they are actually touching these things. With as much a war and interest, and particularly a ring, enamelled, with a little blue flower, a little blue flower, flower in which in, uh, we in England call the forget-me-not. There were also gold coins and fragments of military weapons. So he's excavating in a, in a location and he's finding artifacts, gold coins and rings. A ring with a flower is discussed and illustrated in Woodford's second letter to his brother dated the 28th of February. And that's Woodford's birthday, by the way. That's why he's writing to it. I think of getting a ring or two when I go to Paris made in imitation of, and there's the drawing, and the word petal will be a pretty present. The enamel of the leaves was white, not blue, of the flowers and letters red, <coughs> very bright and well enamelled. That sounds like another ring again. Remember, we're supposed to have found four rings. So this sounds like we've got two, the description of these two rings. Another ring is briefly described in 1847. Sir John Woodford is in possession of a gold ring found on the field of Agenor, which bears the inscription Burro Berto Ber I apologise for my Latin. Bererio, and that is a charm against bad luck. According to Crossfight, Woodford wrote to the Duke of Richmond on the 30th of September 1874 with the following disturbing information. Now he's writing to a member of the aristocracy giving him information that he thinks is important. 
inform his grace that the facsimile of the four gold rings found in the field of the Battle of Ashley in 1818 and now in the library of Goodwood. So the facsimiles are, facsimiles are written in Goodwood. Are the only remains recording the existence of those four rings, the originals having been unfortunately destroyed in the late fire at the Pantheca. There is with them a panoramic view of the battlefield, together with one of the gold coins. <coughs> one of the gold coins. There is an inscription inside one of the rings, Burro Berto Berio. So that's a confirmation of the uh, Burro Beri, uh, Ber Berto uh, ring with the inscription, but also one of the gold coins. Woodford's first letter stated that he found at least two gold coins. And that's from his own mouth. One gold coin was illustrated prior to the fire by the artist William Turner, shown here. With the annotation, a gold coin found in Agincourt, presented to Walter Fawkes by Sir Edward Barnes in 1823. And this here <coughs> is a little velvet pouch that the coin was kept in until very recently. So, William Turner painted this, painted the coin, as you can see there, and then kept the coin in this velvet pouch on the illustration itself. I've seen the illustration, I've held the gold coin in the hand, it is real, and therefore, and it still resides in this location. So we're getting physical information from Woodford's excavations. That coin still resides within the Fawkes residence near Leeds, Yorkshire, and therefore it is probably not the same one as that referred to above as being in the library at Goodwood. They're in different places at different times. As we know that Woodford stated that he found at least two gold coins, we can now suggest that both have been accounted for, only, although only one currently located. Remember, there are descriptions that people said there were several gold coins. There are descriptions around that said that he found over 60 gold coins. There is only physical evidence for two, and he actually stated that he found them. Descriptions of several of Wardsburg Woodsman's finds therefore seem to corroborate his version of events, but not the later elaborations of what he found. Also, a report from the Chief of the Regional Gendarmerie, uh, dated the 20th of March 1818, thanks to Christoph, uh, who gave me this information, also confirmed that Woodford had carried out excavations and that, quote, the bones were reinterred on the 12th of this month in the presence of the prefect of St. Paul, St. Paul, and the mayor of Lepon. There is therefore independent documentary evidence that Woodford had found human remains, which is important. So where were the bones and the artifacts probably found? Going back to the letter, the first letter, according to Woodford's first letter, the gold coin was, quote, found in the ground where the knights were buried amongst a quantity of old bones, as of bones, and the remains of skulls, particularly teeth. And we now know, according to Woodford and the map, that this is the location of the current Calvert, or the Calvary, the place of the interment of 5,800 French knights. So, we seem to be focusing on one position, one location, and that's this location that is now overgrown with trees and shrubs. I think it's just been cleared again, Office, but I think it's been cleared a little bit again, hasn't it, yeah. recently for the commemorations. So we seem to be very focused, we've got at least two gold coins, it sounds like we've got several rings, at least three or four, uh, we've got some human remains, and we seem to know where they're coming from, that's this location here. How many human remains were discovered? Well, Woodford letter exactly states, of the bones I have collected a little box full, all that bore removal. Now, this is quite acidic soil, uh, as you go. So, the skeletal remains would not have been in perfect condition. So, it sounds as though he's finding his skeletal remains and then they're virtually falling to pieces as he's digging them up. But he's digging up teeth and a few small bones. But not a great amount, it's not extensive. A small box, that's a little box full. I have ordered an open sarcophagus for the bones a little illustration in, the, uh, in his letter. And given the details and dimensions, but he doesn't say what they are. We don't know if this open sarcophagus is this big, <laughs> or two or three metres, so we don't know how big it is. But 
Judging by the last letter, it sounds like he's collected a little box full. So it's probably on the smaller side than the larger side. Size. I have settled with the, ma uh, the mayor and the curate to deposit them in Agincourt churchyard. And that's supposedly where they went. All of this is confirmed uh, in 1836 in the letter uh, of discussion with the Duke of Wellington. On the road to uh, Agincourt, he discussed that in 1815, Colonel Woodford brought the right to, of digging there. He got to the very place where Frossor uh, says that the French knights were all buried, and he found stirrup irons and spurs and other things. There's no other evidence he found stirrup irons and spurs. But obviously, this is 20 years later, and presumably uh, uh, Wellington couldn't remember what he found. But remember found them finding something. After he had worked a fortnight or three weeks, it was in fact a fortnight, the Duke of Richelieu came to me and said, you have no idea what a noise this is making. I must beg of you to put a stop to it. And so I gave Woodford a hint. <laughs> Dig in the elbow, please go away, you're making my life miserable. This is after the Battle of Waterloo. It's supposed to be uh, pacifying the French. Go away. And that's all we've got. he's got to say about it. So in summary, Woodford allegedly excavated the location he called Cullen Calvary. <coughs> he apparently found human remains. He apparently found artifacts, including at least two gold coins and at least two, but allegedly four, rings. One coin has been located and now resides near Leeds. The current evidence suggests that Woodford's two letters are an accurate description of events that took place on the battlefield at Agincourt in 1818. There is no reason to doubt that those letters and what he was writing in them is all are authentic. And so, we must assume that he excavated at the site of the current Calvary. So, in 2002, we were asked to uh, carry out a uh, survey <coughs> and excavations on the battlefield of Agincourt. Um, some of it was primarily metal detecting. We did an extensive uh, survey. Uh, with my colleague Simon Richardson as part of the Agincourt Battlefield Archaeology Project. This is still ongoing, by the way. It's, a, it's apparently simple aim, ha ha, is to discover and record definitive physical archaeological evidence of the Battle of Agincourt. That must be simple, sure. <laughs> Surely, of all that huge battle that's been undertaken on that piece of land, there must be at least one artifact that I can find and say, yes, it is. But, <laughs> Archaeology isn't that simple. So what qualifications have I got to do this? How dare I go to such a famous battlefield and, and assume I can just wander in there and find something of significance? But we have a history. The methods were to be similar to those used during our highly successful surveys of the medieval battlefield of town in 1461 in Yorkshire in England. And we were quite successful. Uh, we found at the moment it's well over a thousand artifacts the 15th century material. Some of it's battle related, some of it's just very fine uh, equipment and harness. Uh, a lot of it is gold leafed, so it's expensive. It's not something that would be on a normal farmer's cart. Uh, at the moment, we found over 350 medieval arrowheads from a very, very small location, probably two or 300 square meters. It's not covering the whole of the battlefield. So this is a very small amount of evidence, or a large amount of evidence from a very small location. We've also found one of the earliest composite lead shots in the whole of Europe, from an, a very early uh, gun. And we've also found two fragments of one of those guns. We've also found extensive human remains. Uh, these are from in and around Tatton Hall. Uh, which lies to the north of the battlefield, and as you can see, we've got a mass grave, excavated in 1996, two individuals from 2003 and 2002, and then some, another multiple grave and another individual from the excavations in 2005. So, we've been quite fortunate in that respect. We've also looked on the battlefield, and we've now found the location of the mass graves themselves from the majority of the combatants. And so we've got the archaeological discovery of the mass graves, we've done geophysical survey over them, and we've actually excavated into them and found that they are disarticulated human remains. They are not complete mass graves full of uh, complete skeletons. 
In fact, the majority of it is semi-articulated, so we have almost complete hands, almost complete feet. Uh, the biggest bones we found is radius and ulna, which is loose bones there, and they were semi-articulated. Uh, there they are, shown there. Semi-articulated. So when these individuals are excavated in 1483, on the orders of Richard III, they were semi-articulated, they were not fully decomposed. So it's only 20 odd years after the Battle of Town, so therefore they were not fully decomposed, and that's why there are significant big chunks of human remains, but not complete skeletons. We were therefore quite confident that a vital evidence the battle existed at the acknowledged site of Agincourt, then we should be able to find some traces of it, had we had some success from somewhere else. And here we are from the 2002 metal detector survey. As you can see, uh, Calver, or Calvary is the red uh, rectangle or rhomboid. And uh, the crossroads just to the south of it, all the way down to Maison Cell and further north and further to the west. And no identifiable medical artifacts were located from this limited sample. It is limited. Uh, we were limited by the, the crop in the field at the time. So where the crop had been taken off, we were allowed to do some survey, but the crop was extensive elsewhere. So it's not definitive. Uh, we can't say that is not where the battle hatching core is, but we can't find any evidence of it, which is slightly surprising. Because we've got evidence from, if I can highlight this mouse, see this there? Uh, that is a prehistoric flint core. There are some Roman coins in that lot. There are from some first, oh, there are some uh, lead musket balls and pistol balls. There are some First World War ammunition, uh, fragments of ammunition, and there's some Second World War uh, evidence of military combat. But there is no, there are no medieval artifacts, which is very, very unusual, because we found Roman pottery and we found later pottery. We couldn't even find much medieval pottery which made me tend to think that it may not have been an agricultural site. It might have been grassland, which is not what the, the, the documents tell us. They say they fought on cultivated ground. So does that mean we're in the wrong location? We don't know. Until so we can find evidence for it, we don't know yet. We thought we'd found one arrowhead. We went slightly... Uh, I almost said ballistic there, but that's a, that's a bad one, I'm sorry. We, went, we got slightly excited when we found this. Uh, it looks like an overhead. And we took it to the Royal Army, so we've been uh, x-raying all our overheads from the town over 350 now. And they said, it's sharp at one end, but it doesn't look like an overhead, because there is no socket on it. So we were completely deflated, but when I compared Woodford's letter with this, that's one of Woodford's overheads. And you don't get much more similar than that. <laughs> so I thought, oh, so maybe I was forced in our head. Or maybe Woodford's wasn't. <laughs> so again, we don't know. <laughs> so it just gets more intriguing as we go along here. Um, so what we do is we go to the battlefield itself and we also do some, uh, we did some geophysical survey. And we chose to do the area around uh, the, uh, the enclosure that the Calvary now stands in. And then in 2002, we did around it, and in 2007, we finally got permission to do the geophysical survey inside it. And these are some of the results. And there is no <coughs> definitive evidence of either an excavation or of graves in there. But I've been looking at this more closely recently, and I'll see what we do this. What there is, you can barely make out. See this? We don't know what that is, but it's almost as if it's a sort of circular in two hours there. Now we dug a very, very big hole here. What you do is you throw all the spoil there and all the spoil there. But if that is a hole, it's huge. It's bigger than this room. Probably about two or three sides the size of the tree. Now Woodford had 60 men at his disposal. It is possible to dig a hole that big. But he said he dug it three feet deep. So, it is actually entirely possible that he dug a hole and literally removed everything from there. We don't know. Um, but we tried and we looked. So we did some small excavations 
shown by the little rectangles, and also some augers. We drilled holes, trying to find evidence of human remains or even disturbance in the subsoils, and we couldn't find them. Here's one of the holes near the Calvary uh, Cross base. It was uh, about 0.8 metres deep. We even uh, we couldn't find any trace of any disturbance of the soil, so we even dug up an even deeper hole with the, uh, with the auger, drilled through the middle of it, and we still couldn't find any traces. Uh, so it's either an absolutely massive excavation that he's removed and then put all the soil back, very, very clean soil, or he wasn't digging there. But we can't find, we were very, very limited in our ability to excavate there. We had uh, only permission to dig some very, very small holes, which is unfortunate. Really. Here's another one. As you can see by the soil profile, it just goes from topsoil to subsoil. And you go as deep as you want, there does not seem to be any evidence of disturbance in that soil. There is certainly no evidence of human remains, even fractures. <coughs> what we did find, as you go through the gate into the present Calvary, you go over some, uh, I think these are reburied again now, Christopher, yes. Um, you go over some stones, and you could see them when we first went there in 2002. So we excavated them, and we came across this. And it's a formal wall containing holes, as you see in the big blocks, for railings and a gateway between the road and the present Calvary. Now what is it? Is it just a gateway? And there it is. Handily photographed <laughs> for us. And there it is in situ. Is that all it is? Because it's made up of 18th century brick and stone. Not modern brick, not 19th century brick, 18th century brick. So is it made up of fragments of the chapel that once stood in this ground? Or have they brought the bricks from somewhere else? We don't know. The base of the Calvary is made up of 18th century bricks as well, which is interesting. So it looks like there were some bricks on the site. So that's the early photograph showing the Calvary and the gate. However, do the excavated remains simply represent a gateway to the enclosure? Or are the remains of the front wall of the chapel built in 1734? Because they look remarkably <coughs> like this. So is that what they found? Is that what the chapel looked like? That is now or formally stood in the location of the present Calvary. Because if we look at the map from 1825, the cadastral plan, it does show the place of the ancient chapel of Gascogne. Uh, but does it illustrate the site of an excavation? It looks, it doesn't look like a building, does it? Does it look like a demolished building? Or does it show Remember, it's, it was published in 1825, so it's only a few years after Woodford's been there. Does it show Woodford's excavation? And we don't know. <laughs> Which, again, is very frustrating. So, more frustration. If Woodford excavated here, why did he not mention the former chapel that's supposed to be standing there? Or did he just completely eliminate it by digging it all away? Or was it not there at all? Again, we don't know. So, future work. It is feasible that the 2007 archaeological excavations have missed evidence both of the Graves and of Woodford's work. They weren't very deep, they weren't very extensive because we were not given permission to do so. They had been limited shallow subsurface investigations and were far from extensive, given the conditional and restricted permission to excavate on that occasion. The only way to determine if the site of the Calvary is the site of the masquerade is a chapel or both is to excavate a much larger, deeper area. But that's a moment beyond our control. But it's a good suggestion. Alternative information. Right, this is where it's slightly, I go off tangent a little bit, but hopefully if you bear with me, you'll see where I'm going. Bearing in mind that the current lack of archaeological evidence of the battle is it worth revisiting other evidence related to Woodford's notes and maps that he made in 1818? Remember, he found something and he was talking to the locals before all this became very, very popular in the later 19th century. Although he drew up his map informed by the standard interpretation of where the battle took place, his annotations provide additional points of interest. And this is the rest of his map. We know what the map looked like. And the standard interpretation is shown where the lettering is on the right, where the English and the French were. But if you look at other things on the map, it, it gets quite intriguing. For example, in the southwest of Agincourt, he suggested the route of the march of 400 men at arms, which is quite a lot of men, which 
which highlights his belief that a significant number of troops were used in this area. And that's on the map. He also noted along this route a location known as Mont Boreal, although the map does not explain what its relevance to the battle is. So why did he put it on there? Mont Mariel, what does it mean? Crossfade enlightens us by stating that <coughs> notice the elevated ground on the left of the English position called the Mont Mariel. The inhabitants have always understood from their fathers that the battle commenced on the Mont Mariel. And it was probably over this ground that the English detach detachment marched. This information is at odds with all other descriptions of the battle. This is the French that are telling us this. It's not what we are telling other people. And it happened before Woodford. Does it mean anything? In the standard modern interpretation of the battlefield, this small hill plays no part whatsoever in the engagement as it is significantly distant from the accepted site, so everybody's ignored it. But what does Morial mean? Does anybody know? <coughs> anybody got a clue what it might mean? I've looked everywhere, I can't find anything related to Morial at all. In which case, it doesn't mean anything. Unless he's got it wrong. The map of 1825 shows an adjoining valley annotated along its length as Lert or La Mori Val. Remember, this is 1825, this is just around the time Ed, uh, Woodford is excavating and he's there. And this is an old field name. So, this is, as with all the other uh, scripts on there, these are the old field names that have been supplanted by these rect uh, rectilinear modern field systems. So, we're talking about a very old information from old maps that no longer exist. The suffix val presumably relates to the word valley. It's in a valley, why shouldn't it? But that leaves us with mori. The Latin translation of mori is to die. The connection of the two words possibly suggests a meaning similar to the valley of death or a death valley, an intriguing field name, and thus similar to those of the other medieval battlefield sites such as those of Bloody Meadows of Town and Tewkesbury. Uh, the use of this word, compared with the fact that the locals believed it marked the location of the start of the battle, is intriguing. Have we been getting it wrong all this time? The map of 1825 also shows a field to the south of the Morival, annotated with the name Longley. This is a French writing Longley, not the English writing Longley. So this is something to do with the English. So if you put it all together, we are therefore faced with a conundrum. The 1825 map does not give any battle-related names on the traditional site to the east of Agincourt, but it does include names which might suggest that the battle took place to the west or southwest of Agincourt. The Cassini map of the late 18th century also places a battle, a sword, to the west of Agincourt. The plan of Nichols' Battle of Agincourt 1827 places the English baggage to the west of Maison Cell approximately in the same location as a field named Longley on the 1825 map. It also places a battle to the southwest of Azincourt in about the same location as a valley noted as Morival. Crosslake further describes Woodford's annotation by stating that it was probably over this ground that the English detachment marched, which immediately before coming into action, set fire to the farm belonging to the Priory of St George. And there it is, just inside the village of Azincourt. He noticed particularly, quote, sorry, he noticed particularly the stone in the village of Azincourt, which formerly held a cross, and is said to mark the spot where the Comte de Chateauneuf received his mortal wound. A stone in the middle of the village marking the death of somebody important, not to the west, sorry, further to the east on the accepted battlefield, but in the, in the village of Azincourt itself. The western side of Azincourt is full of early documented possible links with a battle which even appeared to form a sequence of events, basically from the south, sweeping round the west side, ending up very close to the current battlefield, uh, whereas the eastern side contains only one, the Calvary. Have we been getting it wrong? Or is it part of something else, something bigger we don't quite understand? This new information does not rule out the possibility that the battle was also fought in the area between Azincourt and Trancourt. Medieval battles could be fought over a large area of land, potentially including all areas around the village 
of Azenfloor. What the information does is to suggest that Woodford's overall interpretation is potentially incomplete, and at least a part of the initial phase of the battle was further to the west. If this is incorrect, then a new area of interest opens itself up to further investigation. <coughs> In order to investigate these queries further, additional archaeological work needs to be carried out on this important site of conflict. It is worth bearing in mind that archaeological investigations at Town have now answered many questions relating to that conflict. As a potential analogy, the location of a small chapel at Town marks only a small number of graves of the fallen. The majority of the dead at Town are shown to have lain in, a mass, in mass graves in the centre of the battlefield almost one kilometre to the south, amidst concentrations of artefacts and arrowheads recorded in their many hundreds as illustrated on the following map. So we found a battlefield chapel, or the, rem the, rem the remains of the archaeological evidence for that in terms of the burials, the consecrated grounds, at town, inside town and village. There were human remains there, just as there are within the Calvary, allegedly by Woodford at Agincourt. A kilometre or two kilometres uh, from the centre of the battlefield at town, we now know there are extensive mass graves, or we're in the process of excavating and recording those. But they are completely different in terms of location. Is this what we're looking at at Agincourt? Have we got a parallel in that there are different areas of human remains, and therefore the battlefield is significantly bigger than we currently assume it is. Much additional, work, much additional work needs to be carried out on the battlefield that has in course to enable us to compare it with the results from town. This will rely on extensive cooperation between everyone who believes that the site is not only valued, but that it should be protected and investigated further. If permission is forthcoming, and our Agincourt Battlefield Archaeology Project would like to continue looking for evidence of the conflict. As we meet today, to discuss topics such as the number of combatants and the number of dead, it is sobering to realise that there is still currently no physical evidence of the Battle of Agincourt ever having taken place in any location. Did it even exist? <laughs> yes, of course it did, because Alan's found the historical evidence for it. But without the archaeological evidence, we cannot put that into a specific location. And we're only approximating when we say we think we know where it is, because there is currently no evidence for it. So, Woodford appears to have found some answers. Have we been ignoring him for too long? I know it's a bit short, but thank you very much.